Hello, welcome to Think Tech. This is Crystal, and I am so happy to have my guest today to talk. You know, let me just back up and say that I thought I was the only Wonder Woman around, and then I came to this uh, exercise class, this Pilates class here in Hong Kong, and lo and behold, this amazing instructor like was just cracking the whip and just pushing us to our limits and just the voice and power and energy just put me to shame. And so I needed to bring her here to talk about what it means to push boundaries. What does it mean to deal with an aging body and go past that and strength and beauty and all these things that are embodied in this person. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce my wonderful guest, Beth, Beth Narain. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's so nice. <laughs> So Beth, I know I'm going to let you talk out your background, but just to give our audience at Think Tech a little gist of who you are, um, you're originally from South Africa and you had won a scholarship to go to the Royal Ballet in London. And yeah. then you were also, uh, was a choreo, you know, I'm going to let you tell us about how you got to Hong Kong, but just to tell people that you were the you know, you were a choreographer for dances here in a TV station here called TVB in Hong Kong. And you were Hong Kong's first lady DJ, amazing, at the Peninsula Hotel, iconic, iconic. And you were the first, um, you created the first woman's exercise studio here in Hong Kong. So that's just like a couple of your groundbreaking um, moments as a female, especially an expat female at the time in this post-colonial city. So let's talk about this. How did you end up in Hong Kong? Um, so when you grew up in South Africa, you trained in ballet, obviously. And tell us where it took you and how it took well, you out of I started training at the age of uh, five years old and then continued in, in South Africa with my ballet. And then we emigrated to London. And that's when I managed to get into the senior Royal Ballet School in London. and. Um, got a bursary to continue there. After that, I danced in Europe, in France, and then in Italy. And I had an older brother living in Hong Kong. He'd been living in Hong Kong for many years. Um, he was actually the brains behind the uh, rugby sevens in Hong oh. Kong. He started it, ah. yeah. Wow. So I was in between contracts and he said, oh, I'll buy you a ticket to Hong Kong, come for a couple of months and, you know, see if you like it. And so I came and I didn't what, really. What year was that? <laughs> um, 1966. Whoa. Okay. 1966. Tell us what Hong Kong was like in 1966, because I had interviewed somebody who was the ex-governor of Hawaii who had spent time here around that era talking about, you know, the Susie Wong era when he went in Wan Chai, where there were all the sailors coming in. That's that's the vision. That's the image of Hong Kong at the time. What was it like for you? It was, um, well, it was very colonial at that time. And it wasn't, um, I'd just come from Italy. I'd been working in Italy and it was very, it wasn't my sort of, cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, my cup of tea, exactly. But then what happened was, the peninsula opened up this first discotheque in Hong Kong called The Scene. And I got um, a job as a DJ and then later on as the manageress of The Scene. And How did I, you get the job? Were you in music at the time? How, you know? No, no, no. I just, uh, <laughs> I, I actually went to the opening party and I was <laughs> dressed in silver Bieber clothes from the Bieber boutique in London. Love it. And from head to toe, and you know, uh, nobody else was dressed like that at that time. It was really the 1960s look. And um, and the guy said to me, so or well, the girl that was running the place at that time said to me, "Oh, would you be interested in being a DJ?" And I said, "Sure, why not?" So I was work used to working at night because I'd been dancing for for many years, working at night. So anyway, I started working there as the DJ and um, then took over as manageress a little while later. That was during the Vietnam War. Wow. So what yeah. type of clientele were coming in at that time? Oh, um, it was very kind of, um, they were much older group. They were coming down from the Gaddy's restaurant and there was restrictions on uh 
code, dress code, so they had to wear collar and tie and um, a jacket and tie, I should say. But mostly Western, European, European. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of Westerns. Yeah, a lot of uh, expatriates at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Because what I understand, and a lot of people still don't know, the, the image of Hong Kong as cosmopolitan and multicultural it is today, um, mm -hmm. back in the days, like you said, the colonial times was mostly um, British expats uh, yes. filtering through these spaces, whereas the local Chinese were kind of kept in a very local kind of a life yes. in their own little places. Yes, 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 that's true. So it was very uh, expatriate and um, it was a beautiful discotheque and uh, uh, yeah, and slowly, slowly it started to change and we got more relaxed with the dress code and younger people came in and, um, and then but of course... A lot Did of the people, uh, yeah, sorry, one. yeah, you know, yeah. I'm just imagining you in some funky outfit, gorgeous, blonde, you know, spinning, and so people see you as this exotic being there. I mean, that's kind of like the the, the presentation of a place. You know, you you provide this image of the club, right? How did you feel about that? Did you feel like you were kind of objectified or did you feel like this is brilliant? This is my time. You know, you, they take advantage of that, but you also took advantage of this for your own experience yeah. in Hong Kong. Yeah, I wasn't blonde at that time. Oh, <laughs> what color was your hair? <laughs> Black. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Funny. But um, no, I didn't feel objectified at all. It was fun. It was wonderful. It actually was the happiest time of my one of the happiest times of my life and it's what kept me in Hong Kong okay so it was that job um I was also working for television at the same time I was choreographing choreographing for a tv show pop show called um uh, the star show it was kind of like top of the pops you know in the 60s and uh, so I worked till two o'clock in the morning and then I worked from 11 till about three in the afternoon. I was working pretty hard at that time. I was also teaching ballet at the same time and in the afternoon wow. for a ballet, uh, ballet school. So, yeah. So was, at that time you were, how old? How old were you? Uh, 19. Wow. Oh my goodness. Okay. So as a 19 year old, fresh out, doing all these things that come to you and your body is you know, Wonder Woman, right? You're on the top of your game. You have you you have a, a limitless amount of energy and and possibilities with your body, right? So you can manage all these things. And yeah. I'm just gonna kind of zip through how I met you through the fitness class. And it's amazing that you are a grandmother. You are you've had over 52 years of experience in kind of dance fitness and everything. And you look back at your body back then at a 19 year old you. How do you think that that shaped the way you took care of your body today? Hundred uh, hundred percent, it shaped. You know, from my ballet training, the talking about pushing your boundaries. I mean, you do five classes a day at the Royal Ballet School. You know, you you work very very hard because there's a lot of competition, so um, you have to push your boundaries all the time. There's no hanging back or I feel tired or maybe I've got hmm, my period or I can't do my class today or any of that kind of thing. You do it and you push your, push your body to the maximum. And I think that's probably um, instilled in me. And, you know, I don't think I, I get a cold or I feel a bit fluey. It doesn't stop me from going and teaching my classes. Wow. So it's, you just carry on. And I think that that's what makes um, the body a lot stronger. So do you think it's more mental? Uh, I think it's mental and I think it's physical. But you have to have that mental capacity to say, I'm going to push myself even though I want yes. to rest. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You have to have that. I, I see a lot of people a little bit too precious today. You know, they're a little bit too worried about, are they going to catch a cold? And of course, COVID hasn't helped that situation. 
um, or, you know, are they going to get sick or, you know, better not do it because I feel a little bit tired. I mean, you know, uh, you do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. You push your body and you find that from pushing your body that little bit harder, you get that little bit stronger. So just when you think that you've checked out or you've reached your so-called maximum, you push it a little further. Yes. You yes. need to do that, right? You need to do that. You need to do that. Yeah. You need to do that. With, um, yeah, I think, well, for me, I definitely need to do that. I mean, there are many days when I go to work and I think, oh, God, I really don't feel like teaching today. You know, I'm yeah. a bit tired or uh, didn't have a good sleep or something like that but I have to do it and I do it I I probably do it because I have to do it but then once I do it yeah I realize that I could have done it anyway you know it's not that difficult it but isn't. do you think you set the boundaries for yourself so that you have to get that. So you purposely find jobs like you're working at um, this fitness center and you're teaching Pilates. Um, you do it to set the parameters so that you have to go in. Because if you didn't, you could easily have enjoyed your uh, retirement life, being grandma, doing just, you know, sitting back. But you are still teaching. And so is that what pushes you? Like, do you create these setups to continue to push? Maybe, maybe I do, but well, it's, it's my, it's my career. That's the thing. It's what I do. But and most people your age will not keep doing it. Uh, if you're able to do it, I don't see why you shouldn't do it in right. anything. I mean, not just this, in any kind of work. If you're able to work, I don't, um, I don't particularly feel that one needs to retire yes yes no exactly but again how did you develop that sense of um inner strength is it be, did you ever have some life-changing experience that made you feel like you really need to kind of stay on track in a certain way or have you been have you ever gotten off track where you realize that that's not the way to go in order to kind of full fully kind of um Commit to the the ways you strengthen your body. I you had, surely you were a reckless young woman at some point and doing things that were not necessarily good for your body. Sure, yeah, <laughs> I used to, you know, go out at night, stay out till three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and then love it. teach a nine o'clock class. You know, yeah, was that hangover? I did yeah. that many times. Yeah, um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, I also was sick one time in, in Thailand. I, I actually had um, a blood clot oh. and um, and I was in hospital and um, I, I had to stay in the hospital for about 10 days while they dissolved this blood clot. And there was this woman uh, sharing the room with me. I never forget she could hardly, well, she was paralyzed from the same thing. Blood clot went to the brain. And she was completely, well, she was paralyzed. All she could do was slap her leg in order to get her daughter's attention, who was staying in the room with her. Anyway, this woman was taken in a wheelchair um, every day down to physio to, to do her exercise. And she would pass me as I was lying in the bed. And she was so excited to be going down to do her physio exercises. Yeah. You know, her face yeah. was beaming and she was like smiling. And her daughter would say to me, she's so happy she's going down to do her physio. And, um, and I thought, oh, my God, you know, here I can do this every day of my life. I can work out. And I thought, how many how grateful we should be to be able to um, to really exercise and to use our bodies every day. Yeah. And, you know, why sit, think about, oh, I'm tired today, I don't feel like doing anything or, 
oh, I, I've got a headache. I don't think I'll go to class or, you yeah. know, you can, you yeah. can push yourself and right. you, you need to, you need to really be grateful that you can move your body. It's true. And even my 18 year old son reminds me that movement is medicine. Sometimes yeah. I say I'm tired. He says, mom, movement is medicine. It's like, yeah, you're right. You're right. So can I talk about that? Let's talk about movement. Because again, going back to your class, and I hope that we can share that one little clip that I managed to steal of you um, teaching. But that was a Pilates class. That was a bar class. But in your cardio Pilates class, which I had, wish I had a clip, um, you were doing these routines where we had to not just do the movement, but we had to use our brains because you had these choreographic ways to navigate the ball between the left arm and the right leg. And, you know, so it's not just exercise. There's more to it. You know, we have to follow and you're strict. You're telling people, listen to the beat. You know, you're cracking that whip and, and some people are tone deaf. So I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's hard on them, but you are just, um, hardcore. I, I've never had a trainer like you who, um, takes the time to tweak people and to make comments that might just make a huge difference on the way they feel that muscle. Yeah. That comes from my ballet training. Yeah. I mean, as a ballet dancer, as a ballet teacher, technique and staying on the beat with the music is very important to me. And that makes you use your brain. So you're not just, you know, zooming out on while you're doing the exercise right. and watching yourself in the mirror but you really have to concentrate you have to concentrate on a little bit of choreography that I give and and listening to the music because that's what the music is telling you what to do with your body but some people just don't follow the beat they can't they have a different sense of timing right yeah they, <laughs> you don't have two left feet and then what do you do <laughs> it's like they have, I think everybody has the sense of timing. I think people just, um, they don't, they don't concentrate. They, they looking in the mirror or they looking at themselves or they, they not, they not being present. Ah. If, if they being present, they can hear the music. They can follow. I'm doing yeah. it in front of them. They can follow me. But I think that's a very good point. Being present is something we often um, dismiss. Yes, especially when we have routines. You yes. know, we just yes. just fall into it without thinking about it. Without thinking about it, right? Yeah, and that our forty-five minutes that they spend there. Yeah, you know, it's a kind of meditation in a way, because they can really get into that forty-five minutes. They can get into the music. They can get into the choreography. They can get into everything that's that I'm giving them, the energy that I'm giving them in that class. Yeah. You know, you know so. what I noticed in your class that there were more more men than I expected, especially when people associate bar, Pilates or bar is always more of a female thing. So yeah. do you feel like that's more catered to women or is that something that's just been um, misinformed? And how do you think men take Pilates differently from women? Um, I think men, there are quite a lot of men going, doing Pilates. I don't know about bar classes. Bar yeah. classes are very hard. Yeah. Um, the technique is very hard, very difficult to, um, to get those small muscles um, engaged. Men are so used to using the big muscle. They, they, they like to get into the big movement. Um, so when they have to work on the small muscle and get that um you know technique of of that little muscle working underneath the big muscle it's quite yeah it's 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 a bit tricky for them you think but, it's easy for them to dismiss like oh i just it, it's it's too subtle it's not it's not a workout for me so because they can't find that right so they're looking at the larger more obvious like you say the big muscles and they're dismissing those really important subtle subtle movements yes 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 that that's that's true they do find it very difficult i remember one guy coming into my stretch and tone class and he looked around he saw all these women and i guess he looked at me and thought mm, this is going to be easy <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of 
Yeah. Well, she she looks like she could lie down for a while. <laughs> <laughs> you yes. see, judgment. They don't judgment. they don't understand what to see. Yeah. Exactly. So anyway, halfway through the class, he started moaning and groaning. <laughs> and I, I couldn't quite hear what he was saying, but we were doing abdominals and, and the sweat was pouring <laughs> off him. And so it was quite funny because later in the changing room, this woman that was next to him said to me, um, did you hear what that guy was saying during the abdominal workout? I said, no, I couldn't, couldn't catch it. She said he was saying, please, God, don't let me die. <laughs> <laughs> you see? <laughs> struggling so badly. And that was because he wasn't used to those kind of exercises where you you really pull everything in and, and engage all the muscles. He was used to the big bouncy, bouncy. Uh, That's why it's such an important topic to have subtle movements, subtle strength, because that is something that we don't see on the surface. But if you apply it to life, sometimes it's those little things that are, you know, they go invisible because of the larger dominant narratives and, you know, the obvious surface level of everything we see in life, right? Sometimes it's the tiny little details that we don't care to look at that are so important to our well-being, or strength, and everything. Right. But those are the little muscles that support the big muscles ah so they yeah. are the ones that need to be um engaged but to get to there you have to dig deeper you have to dig dig very deep very very deep and you have to work them internally so it's not just the movement that i'm giving that's going to work that muscle. It's you that's going to work the muscle from inside, from really contracting it. It's like so you have to feel it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. We can sit here now as we're talking and we can be doing our abdominal exercises. How? Tell me how. Let's do some. <laughs> <laughs> I need, I always need more core. So as I we're sitting, yeah. sitting here now, while you're talking to me, can you still talk to me by pulling your belly button in towards your spine? Now, really? this is different from the Kegel, right? Not the, the contraction of the pelvic muscles? No, or is it? Not, not the contraction of the pelvic floor muscles pulling up. We want to just draw the belly button in towards the spine. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Feel that? Mm -hmm. Now, think about closing the ribs a little bit inwards like a corset so just imagine you've got a corset on yeah you're clipping from underneath the breastbone one clip and then the next clip and you're clipping all the way down to the pubic bone right so immediately do you feel yourself sitting more upright more upright but then there's a difference between because then I feel like I'm contracting my lungs, which I don't want to do. You know, I, I'm holding in everything, but don't I feel like I want to open up so that I can feel like I'm present and I'm I'm reaching out. You know, yeah. I, don't, I don't. But you're not contracting this way. You're just gently pulling in that way. You're just narrowing your waist. By narrowing yeah. your waist, you're elongating. Right, right. Yeah. And so it has to be a conscious effort, like yeah. consistently. You don't you don't let that go, you're saying. Yeah. 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 I used to I used to say to people when they walk uh, clients, when they're walking down the street, just to feel as though they're pulling their their flesh away from their clothes. Yeah. Okay. Just, just, it's subtle. It's not like Yes. But right. just gently pulling your your flesh, your abdominals, or your waist, yeah. away from your clothes, from whatever yeah. you wear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just get that feeling of lengthening and drawing in. I mean, wow. if you see ballet dancers walking down the street, or you know it, or even ballroom dancers, you can see them straight away, right? You can pick yeah. them out like that. Yeah, yeah. So they have that feeling of pulling up. Yeah, pulling up. 
hold, holding it in from, from inside, from deep inside, right? And you know that. So um, to give, you know, to wrap up our show is what are some tips you can give, obviously, to people who, you know, and some people are not as fortunate to have um, mobile bodies. They have issues, health issues that hinder the movement. So what are, you know, it, it's, again, it's the psychological aspect of it too, but what are some tips you have going forward to, to deal with our aging bodies, whatever level we have? I, I think they should do whatever they can. Tai Chi um, is very good for aging bodies. Um, exercise, uh, not particularly what I'm teaching or, you know, or Pilates or yoga, but whatever they can do movement everyday movement i mean i i see it in the park every day that people yeah. are in there swinging around tapping themselves tapping yes. their legs tapping their head that's a very chinese thing because you're opening you're stimulating all the meridians and all the meridians yes. yeah so any kind of exercise anything yeah. that moves stretch your leg every day when you get up you know stretch your body swing open up your spine, try to touch your toes every day, um, whatever, but movement, because the body needs to move. Yes, that's excellent. Um, and I'm going to spin it back to your experience in Hong Kong back in the days, because this concept of movement makes me think about the movement of Hong Kong of how it's shifted and changed over the time. You know, when you were here, it was a very special time. Um, you know, it was at the kind of a prime of this colonial era of decadence, so to speak, for a lot of the expats. Um, and but then at the same time, there was this tension about the riots. You mentioned that you were here during the riots uh, of the 19. Was it 67? 67, the Cultural Revolution. So yeah. how did that? You know, we look at the riots from a few years ago in Hong Kong. That's kind of changed things. What is you know you seeing that transformation and the two different types of riots, protests? What type of understanding of this place do you have from that? I don't know. It's um, the, during that time, it was pretty bad in 67. It was, it was really bad. I mean, China cut the water supply to Hong Kong. We only had four hours of water every four days in the middle of wow. summer. Wow. Every house was filled with buckets. Buckets and buckets, buckets were at the premium, you know, you were paying more for buckets than food at that time because you had to fill the buckets up and they had to last, the water had to last for four days. So people got uh, bombed, um, bombed, there were, you know, bombings going on around uh, Central um, and I was quite nervous and I, I said to my boss at the Peninsula Hotel at that time, um, you know, I think I might go back to London. And he said, oh, well, well why don't you just wait and see what the Kaduris are doing? If the uh -huh. Kaduris are not pulling out of Hong Kong, you know, it might pass. And sure enough, it did. Indeed. So things, you know, Hong Kong, definitely has a way of bouncing back. Yes, the resilience is really, really amazing. Well, yeah, I think it's gonna take a little longer this time, maybe a couple of years, I don't know. But um, I think it will, I think yeah. it will bounce back. I think things will be okay. You know, I've seen it go through tremendous dips, the financial exactly. crisis, um, yeah. I mean, seeing the world through your eyes as a 19-year-old girl who comes out from ballet and ends up in Hong Kong, um, DJing at, at a, the most uh, exclusive hotel in Hong Kong, and then opening up um, a studio uh, and, and doing all these boundary-breaking things in Hong Kong is just uh, a testimony to your strength and your vision to kind of continue to break boundaries. And I'm really so appreciative of you sharing a bit of your history and the history of Hong Kong with us through your lens. This is brilliant. So thank you so much. This is Beth Narain. If you missed it, please listen. We have so much to learn from this wonder woman. Um, the pleasure was all of ours. Thank you. Mm -hmm.